uh, moderator for today's event. Um, and I'm going to actually just go so you can see her face as she introduces the session. Sharon Leone comes to us from the Center for History and New Media and also History and Art History, and Art history at George Mason University. Sharon, welcome and thank you for moderating today's session. Thank you, Jennifer. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be part of this conversation today. I think we're going to have a uh, lively exchange about scoping and funding crowdsourcing projects. Um, part of my duties for today are to uh, remind you all in the audience about what the, the full scope of the Crowd Consortium project is. Uh, we have a number of um, Oops, I just clicked into Christine's slides there. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, a number of, of goals for the Crowd Consortium project, um, and it was funded in 2014 by the Institute for Museum and Library Services, a national forum grant. And the idea here is that we want to bring together researchers, experts, and practitioners uh, in the area that are working on crowdsourcing projects or want to be working on crowdsourcing projects uh, to facilitate a series of national conversations and try and figure out what are the things that we're missing um, when we think about crowdsourcing projects that will enable us to produce viable projects and move forward in a successful way to bring the community into the work that we do as libraries and archives. Um, so what we are doing is bringing together a variety of institutions and researchers to talk about these things. And we have a number of upcoming events and activities. Um, they include in-personal regional meetings in Los Angeles in February at UCLA and a culminating conference in May in 2015. And the nice thing is that this project was originally funded by our friends at the Institute for Museum and Library Services, but it has expanded to attract support from our colleagues at the National Endowment for the Humanities and at the Sloan Foundation. So CCLA is a completely open organization, and you're free to join us and follow our activities and our conversations. I'm, I'm, I'm only a contributing converser in this, in this world. Um, but you can follow us at the CCLA website, which is crowdsortium.org. And you can also participate via Twitter by following the Crowd Consortium Twitter handle, which is at Crowd Consortium, all one word. Um, this is the second webinar that's taken place in this series. And so right now I'd like to invite Christina Manzo to review uh, the results and products of the last webinar. Christina? Hello, I am, uh, I am remotely logging in from Harvard, the Harvard Law School Library where every uh, study room and quiet place on campus seems to be booked because we are in the middle of finals. So I am in the middle of the stairwell, so if you hear a bit of an echo, that's why. Um, but I'm just going to do a quick review of the first webinar that we had of uh, Crowdsourcing 101. And, uh, and then I will hand it over uh, to uh, Sharon Leone again, uh, and we'll get this started. So we had a great uh, first webinar. Uh, it was Fundamentals and Case Studies of uh, crowd, Crowdsourcing, just basically an introduction. Um, we had over 180 registrants, which was great. Um, and not only did we have uh, many different registrants, but we had uh, a very diverse group of registrants uh, from the U.S., represented over 40 states, uh, the U.K., uh, Canada, and Australia. So uh, we are an international organization, and we would like to, you know, continue to uh, draw as many people from as many different backgrounds as possible to facilitate, you know, a more interesting, well-rounded international uh, conversation. Um, so we, we discussed a lot of different things um, during the webinar. We had a presentation from the from Ms. Mia Ridge, who is a PhD candidate at the Open University and author of Crowdsourcing Our Cultural Heritage. So you could say she literally wrote the book on uh, crowdsourcing in the humanities. Um, she went over definitions of crowdsourcing. Um, and, and also how it differed from crowdfunding, things like Kickstarter, et cetera. Um, typical tasks, 
so let's see, tagging, transcription, housekeeping, sharing knowledge, creating links, et cetera, are all very common in our, uh, in our world. It appears as if we may have lost Christina. Um, perhaps. Uh, oh, there you are. Sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm back. Um, so different uh, uh, audiences and their motivations, whether it's altruistic, philanthropic, um, or they just want to play fun games. It's kind of a diverse group of people that are interested in crowdsourcing. She also offered design tips and, and talked about where crowdsourcing is going as a, as a field, you know, future challenges and things like that. So it was a very interesting introduction. Uh, then we had two different case studies, one from the New York Public Library Labs. Um, uh, uh, we had Ben Virchfell from the uh, Digital Library and NYPL Labs, which was very interesting. He went over um, not only a history of how NYPL Labs got started um, and all their different kinds of projects, pausing specifically to talk about Building Inspector um, and several other of their, of their big projects, such as What's on the Menu, um, but then also outlining, you know, challenges um, that they faced. So one of the things that he mentioned was uh, that they have a three-step authentication process um, to ensure that they really get the best data possible um, out of user-generated uh, metadata and, and user-generated data um, from, from all of their games. Then we also heard um, from Victoria Van Heining, uh, who is the Digital Humanities Postdoctorate, a postdoctoral fellow at Zooniverse, and she talked about um, not only the, the Zooniverse as a whole, um, an introduction to the verse, um, but also um, Operation War Diary, um, which uh, is a very interesting project that allows uh, users to go through uh, documents and, um, and, and records uh, to trans, it's, a, it's a basically a transcription pr uh, process. It's very, very interesting. Uh, they also went over, both, both of them went over challenges and also statistical um, advantages, what, they, what kind of response they've seen, et cetera, um, and how they dealt with those challenges. So it was a very uh, interesting, interesting uh, case study talk with both of them. But then we wanted to hear from you guys. So um, we asked you guys, um, you know, the questions and themes that really stuck out in the in the um, um, in the Q and A were, "This is great. Now what?" So, um, uh, you know, things like, "How many people are needed for consensus on a task, which differs?" Um, where should I host my project? You know, I got this great idea, um, and there are so many of them. Um, and then I, I've collected, I have all this data, what do I do with it? Um, so the current challenge is to develop, you know, workflows to integrate this without, uh, to supplement authority files without replacing them, obviously. Um, and then uh, many of the comments that you guys suggested were about funding from last uh, from last time. So, um, you know, this is great. You know, it was really nice to learn about the basics of crowdfunding, uh, crowdsourcing, and, and crowdfunding, um, and uh, the challenges that are typically faced by somebody trying to uh, to do a project like this. But uh, Time and money are really uh, uh, precious resources uh, in this field. So how do I get this money uh, to do this project that I'm really excited about? Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Sharon, who will, uh, who will get the ball rolling talking about uh, funding. Very, very good. Thank you, Christina. I um, want to flip on through here and let you know that, uh, once again, that the site that you would like to pay some attention to as we move forward through the year is the crowdconsortium.org site for more information about upcoming webinars and those kinds of things. Uh, so I come to you today, you might be wondering, what is this random history professor doing hosting this, this webinar? Um, 
And and that that's a reasonably good question, but my my double life as a history professor includes also the job of being the director of public projects at the Roy Rosenzweig Center for History and New Media, uh, where we have spent the last 20 years, we're in the midst of, of celebrating our 20th anniversary, um, thinking very carefully about what we can do to use digital tools and new media to democratize the practice of history. And that means not only democratizing access to historical materials, but also democratizing the kinds of sources that we collect and save as uh, libraries and museums and archives, and also in involving members of the general public in the process of doing history. And so that's how I come to the question of crowdsourcing and doing crowdsourcing projects. And some of the earliest work that we have done at the, at the center involved what was not even known at that point as crowdsourcing. Um, one of our earliest projects was the September 11th Digital Archive, which you can see a little snippet of here in this slide, uh, which we launched shortly after the um, tragedies in New York and, and Virginia and Pennsylvania in September 2001. We launched the site in 2002 to collect the born digital record of the aftermath of those events because we realized that this was really the first national historic event that would have a really large digital footprint through emails, through voicemails, through um, camera phone pictures and those sorts of things. And that archive, drawn together from the general public, has over 150,000 individual items in it. And so that was an early version of crowdsourcing that, that we like to think of is as collecting in, in participation with the public. But at the opposite end of our collections, we have um, a project that is much more um, directly related to issues and concerns about crowdsourcing, and that's our work with the papers of the War Department. The U.S. War Department burned to the ground in 1800 and took all of the papers with it. And um, so through the years, a number of dedicated documentary editors under the direction of Ted Crackle went out and reassembled that archive, uh, that whole collection to the tune of nearly 42,000 documents. Um, and because we had scans of those received copies, we've done a very non-traditional documentary edition with the papers of the War Department by publishing them first on the web and then doing what we can through the years to improve the metadata and description of those documents. And one of the things that we realized fairly early on in this project was that we were never going to have the capacity ourselves, or the funding frankly, to transcribe those 42,000 documents. And so we thought, hmm, how can we go about, how can we go about making a dent in providing text transcription of these um, very, quite varied documents? And because it's a collective archive, not all of these documents are done in one hand. They're done in many different hands, which makes it, it hard for somebody to get rolling on doing the transcriptions. Um, but we said, because we have capacity in tool building and resource building that we thought maybe we can develop a tool that would make it possible for members of the general public to help us with this task. And so that's exactly what we did with uh, funding from the National Endowment for the Humanities and then eventually almost at the same time funding from the National Archives through the National Historic Records and Publications Commission. Um, we built a tool that we, that we tested first with the papers of the War Department um, and then made available for other folks to use. And so we've been working on um, allowing members of the general public to transcribe the papers of the War Department. We're now in our 44th month of uh, that project. And since then, we've had about 2,000 users contribute. Uh, so that's, you know, it's not a huge number of, of people, but we're making, we're slowly making fairly significant progress. Since we've started, we've, we've had 15,000 different documents worked on out of the 42. That's not to suggest that all 15,000 of those are complete. Um, but slowly but surely, members of the public participating for a variety of reasons. Sometimes it's research, sometimes it's you know scholarly research, sometimes it's family research. 
um, to some degree, we get a lot of people who feel like it's their civic duty to participate, which I kind of love as coming from an institution that is dedicated to democratizing history. Um, the generalized version of that tool is a tool called Scripto. And Scripto works with a variety of content management systems. And so we try not to do things at the Center for History and New Media that um, we can't then turn around and help other people launch those same kinds of projects. And so Scripto is a plug-in uh, which we have seen most um, most frequently used with our web publishing platform, the Omeka web publishing platform, but it also has an adapter for Drupal and one for WordPress. So we were hoping with that work to allow other people to launch their own crowdsourcing projects. And so part of being part of the crowdsortium conversation about crowdsourcing is, is helping other people launch their own uh, their own crowdsourcing projects. And our conversation for today is about how to get funding to do those kinds of, of projects and how to scope those projects so that they're attractive to funders. And so we have two wonderful guests with us today um, who you don't often get this chance to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with, with prime federal funders. But our first guest who's going to take us through um, some conversation about the thinking about crowdsourcing for libraries and archives from the National Endowment for the Humanities is Brett Bobley. And um, Brett wears a lot of hats <laughs> at the NEH. Uh, Brett is not only the Chief Information Officer for the NEH, he's also the Director of the Office of Digital Humanities. In fact, the founder of the Office for Digital Humanities. And through the course of the existence of that division at NEH, Brett and his staff have been responsible for a remarkable amount of good work in the digital humanities and particularly in widening the reach of the projects that, uh, that we're all interested in launching. So I want to hand it over to Brett now to uh, tell us a little bit about NEH and, and crowdsourcing. All right, terrific. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, I'm really pleased to be here today um, and uh, to talk to all you folks. Here at, the, here at the NEH, obviously we're a federal government agency that makes grants in the humanities. Um, in my office in particular, though, we are we're particularly interested in projects that utilize digital technology in one way or another um, to study the humanities or, for, or, or sometimes also projects that actually um, study technology itself from a humanistic perspective. Um, so, but crowdsourcing is something that's been of, of interest to us for some time. Um, in, for, for, a number of different, for a number of different reasons, I think. Um, I think one of which is we certainly love the idea that crowdsourcing can help a, a library or an archive or other organization um, use the power of the crowd to help uh, catalog things, to help transcribe things, to um, make their collections better and more usable for others, uh, whether they be scholars or educators or members of the public. Um, but also, I think, you know, as, as Trevor Owens from the Library of Congress points out, uh, another thing that's great about crowdsourcing is that it enables members of the public to really engage with your collection in a really deep way. If someone's coming to your collection to actually, for example, transcribe stuff, they're obviously reading it and engaging with it in a, in a, in, in a really um, a tight fashion, in a, in, in a really deep fashion. And uh, that's something that we at the NEH really like to support. We want to see people um, taking advantage of and learning about the humanities, going to primary sources and that kind of thing. Um, I wanted to point out we have a new chairman here at the NEH. His name is William Bro Adams. That's right, his name is actually Bro, and we call him Bro too, which is funny. I have to say it was a little bit weird when he said, call me Bro, and I was like, okay, Bro. Um, anyway. One of our new chairman's initiatives that he is just rolling out now, he's calling the common good. And in a nutshell, it's his attempt to make a better case for why the humanities is important for the general public. He wants to make the case that humanities isn't just about research, but that it is also about day-to-day um, -day life. It's about engaging members of the public, engaging teachers and students um, in history and literature, and of course, in all the materials in our libraries and archives related to the humanities. So I really feel like crowdsourcing 
really fits in with our new chairman's um, new, new common good initiative. Because really, crowdsourcing directly connects members of the public to humanities research. It directly connects the public to libraries and archives in a, in a really engaged and, and deep way. So we're, we're really, um, really pleased to be um, involved in, in various uh, crowdsourcing activities and uh, looking forward to funding more projects. So I, I'm not going to talk for a long time. I just wanted to point out, here's just a couple of, uh, of some of the crowdsourcing-related projects that we have funded. Um, I won't go into a lot of detail, but we all, here are all the links if you want to check them out. Um, Metadata Games, of course, is Mary Flatting's project at Dartmouth, which has been really successful. Um, I know the Metadata Games platform you see popping up all around the world. Different libraries are taking that open source platform and using it. Um, to engage the public, to help to help them tag photographs from their collection, things like that. Um, what's on the menu, which I know was talked about a little bit at the uh, previous webinar. That's a project at New York Public Library to transcribe restaurant menus, and um, I understand that Mario Batali uses it, so that I, I think I can retire happy now. Um, resurrecting Early Christian Lives is a project um, involving the University of Minnesota, Oxford, and also the Zooniverse folks are involved in that as well. And that involve, that, that, that's transcribing documents in, in the Coptic language, which is really fascinating. The idea of um, helping the, having the public help to transcribe something in a language that most people don't, don't speak anymore. <laughs> um, you know, it's interesting. I know that the Zooniverse people have been involved in a few projects like that, transcribing ancient documents and things like that. And you know, one of the cool things about crowdsourcing is by using the power of the crowd, of course, you can find people who are really interested in almost any topic. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's one of the, the neat things about, about kind of leveraging, the, you know, the, the Internet is that while there, there aren't millions of people interested, certainly, in transcribing Coptic documents, there are some. There are maybe hundreds, right? And, and um, those are the types of people who would love to be involved in a project like that. Um, another one is Scripto, which, of course, our, our wonderful uh, moderator and host, Sharon, was talking about just a moment ago, the Scripto tool. And lastly, Scribe, which is a platform that the New York Public Library folks are developing in concert with some of the Zooniverse people as well. Uh, it's a full-blown crowdsourcing platform. And um, so again, you know, if you're interested in doing your own crowdsourcing project, I would definitely encourage you to check out things like Scripto and Scribe and Metadata Games, these kind of platforms that already exist that you might be able to leverage at a very low cost um, to start doing your own uh, project. But I will also note that um, if you're interested in a project that requires grant funding, certainly do get in touch with us. Um, obviously, with a name like the National Endowment for the Humanities, you're, we would, ex we would um, of course, require that your project is related to the humanities in some fashion. Usually that would mean, for example, if you were a library or archive, the, the materials in question would be ones that would be of interest to uh, humanities uh, scholars of one sort or humanities teachers of one sort or, or whatever they might be. Um, but, you know, it's a pretty pretty wide definition of what, what that could be. We have many different grant programs that could potentially support a crowdsourcing activity. Um, please feel free to get in touch with us if you have any questions. Uh, we have so many different grant programs that often the best bet is to just get in touch with, with, with someone here at the NEH. Um, you can certainly feel free to shoot us an email at the Office of Digital Humanities, uh, which is odh at neh.gov. Again, that email is odh at neh.gov. Let us know what kind of a project you might be working on, and we'll be happy to help you identify which of our grant programs would be most appropriate for your project, because we want you to succeed, and uh, we, we wouldn't want you to spend a lot of time applying for a grant program if it, didn't, if it wasn't the best fit for what your project is all about. So that is me. That's my email address if you want to email me. It's also my Twitter handle. So feel free to get in touch if you ever have any questions or are interested in an NEH grant. Thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to Sharon. Thank you so much, Brett. Uh, having, having applied for lots of those grants and, and, and gotten some of them, I can tell you uh, how wonderfully helpful the uh, staff at the NEH are, and particularly in the Office of Digital Humanities. Uh, if their programs are not right for your project, they can certainly direct you to the ones that are. Um, our next guest for today has been uh, a friend of mine for a long time now, and I think that's, uh, that's kind of a wonderful thing. Uh, Robert Horton 
comes to us from the Institute for Museum and Library Services, where he is uh, the Deputy Director for Library Services, and he is responsible for managing discretionary grant programs on the library side. But I have known Bob um, since he was the State Archivist at uh, the Minnesota Historical Society. He was there also was the Director of Library Publications and Collections Division at uh, Minnesota Historical. And so he's going to talk to us for a little bit today about the kinds of crowdsourcing things that IMLS is interested in. Bob, off thank to you. you. Yes, thank you very much, Sharon, and thank you all for uh, participating today. It's really a pleasure to be part of a webinar like this, to be, to be part of a project like this, and to be able to talk to you today and explore crowdsourcing with some such excellent partners. So um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here. So I'm going to uh, start just to show you a list of some upcoming funding opportunities and talk to you a little bit about those programs so you have an idea of what sort of proposals that the IMLS is looking for. And uh, those are the National Leadership Grants Program with a deadline in February, the Sparks Ignition Grants Program with a deadline also in February, and then the Laura Bush 21st Century Librarian Program with a deadline in September. So I'll talk about uh, National Leadership and Laura Bush primarily. Either could fund projects related to crowdsourcing and uh, to support for crowdsourcing projects. There's a significant difference in the way the two are designed, though, that's Im important to keep in mind. The National Leadership Grant Program is primarily about innovative projects and research, uh, activities that are going to inform and illuminate, uh, advance the librarian and archival professions as a whole. So you wouldn't want to come to the National Leadership Grant Program with a proposal that said, um, I saw what so-and-so uh, uh, was doing with Scripto, for example, and I would like to do it too. Because that, that's, um, that could be an extraordinarily valuable project. It could address extraordinarily valuable content, but um, it wouldn't move the, the, uh, the, uh, the professions forward. So what uh, National Leadership Grant programs primarily are interested in, the, the single most important criterion that reviewers look for is impact and a fairly broad impact. So if you were looking at, say, new tools, uh, working with crowdsourcing with new types of content, uh, 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 reaching out to new, new audiences, uh, in some ways, doing something that no one else has done before or building on, expanding on, enhancing the value of some, something that someone has done before. Those would be competitive proposals uh, in the National Leadership Grant Program. For Laura Bush, uh, that program is primarily about education and training for professionals in the library and archival uh, professions. So uh, this is really an opportunity to address a, a kind of issue um, or a challenge or problem that I often think of as uh, we have lots of ideas and lots of proposals, lots of projects that present themselves as models. What we don't have are a lot of uh, followers, or I would put it. We don't have a lot of uh, people um, saying, um, I need to know how to do that. Or I would say, or I, say I should correct myself. We have a lot of people saying, I need to know how to do that. Um, I need support in terms of education or training to understand how I can work with my audience, how I can adapt these tools to my environment, how I can move forward. And there's a continuing, I think, um, uh, underinvestment, underinvestment um, lack of appreciation in all the kind of support structures that need to be in place for uh, other organizations, other institutions, other archivists and librarians to, um, to uh, adopt the models that are out there. So with continuing education possibilities, for crowdsourcing proposals, I think, um, are enormous. There's a lots of opportunities uh, for groups to sort of think about how could we teach, how could we um, promote, how could we do the outreach to uh, librarians and archivists so they can implement successful uh, crowdsourcing proposal uh, projects. What do they need to know? Um, what skills do they need to have? Um, where can they find those skills? So that would be um, extraordinarily uh, valuable. Uh, the link, the uh, URL I have at the bottom of this slide, uh, will connect you to the uh, various guidelines and notification of funding opportunities for our programs where you could learn a lot more about how to apply to the IMLS. I'm going to mention um, just two projects 
uh, related to crowdsourcing that we've invested in. Um, and just two, because frankly, we haven't uh, really ha invested a lot in, in crowdsourcing. We haven't uh, seen all that many proposals in this area. So again, we'd be very interested in, in, in hearing more from you. And both of these, uh, interestingly, and I should uh, point out, uh, both of these are, are really uh, uh, collaborations of uh, uh, both conscious and uh, accidental uh, with the NEH. So uh, I think it's a good sign that uh, the funding agencies are, are converging in many ways in terms of their interests. And, and Brett and I have spoken and uh, plan to have much more deliberate uh, connections and uh, collaborations in the future in this area. The first uh, is a digging into data proposal, and, and Brett mentioned digging into data. And this was a grant uh, to uh, support the Missouri Botanical Gardens work in the Biodiversity Heritage Library and integrate um, crowdsourcing into uh, the BHL's efforts to develop a um, semantic search test system. So um, taking advantage of the expertise that's out there in that audience, uh, that user base, uh, to enhance and enrich the descriptions of the content uh, that's in the Biodiversity Heritage Library. Uh, Mukutu uh, is a similar type of project, um, but I think um, one note worth noting uh, because, and again, this is one that the NEH has funded as well, because uh, it is um, notable for a very clear and defined uh, uh, it's a very clear and defined example of a crowd. It's almost more like uh, a community sourcing effort in the sense that it's a, a, a collections management system, an online collections management system in this instance, uh, that is reaching out to uh, tri tribal uh, uh, librarians, archivists, tribal, tribal um, community members uh, to capture and um, uh, 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 preserve their knowledge about the artifacts, items, and, and um, documents and images in uh, museum, uh, museum collections. So it's designed to help with uh, specific needs, specific values, um, specific expertise from a specific group that's critical to the development of a larger application. So you have, in a sense, a kind of virtual workplace uh, that's uh, combined with a repository, and that allows the community um, to uh, uh, add its um, information and then the repositories are capturing and enriching uh, their collections and their descriptions of, of their, their content along with it. So it's a, it's a very interesting and I think a well developed uh, a broad interpretation of, of all the functionality that could be involved in um, crowdsourcing and uh, well worth uh, examination. So uh, as I said, uh, we're certainly interested in, in uh, projects like this. We're certainly interested in crowdsourcing. And I think uniquely among some of the federal funding agencies, we have a program like Laura Bush that is designed to support uh, the continuing education and training that librarians and archivists need to do these things. So uh, if you're looking at national leadership grants, again, you're talking about uh, innovation, um, and uh, moving the, the profession forward in terms of new tools or new content or new audiences. With Laura Bush, uh, you're looking at what do librarians and archivists need to know to do these things, what skills, um, what training, um, what capacity, what partnerships. And uh, that's, I think, again, uh, unique within the federal funding system. So I'll close. Uh, this last slide shows uh, how to contact me. And uh, the uh, website as a whole has contact information for all the program officers in the Office of Library Services. All of us would be happy to talk to any of you at any time. And I would add as well that if you're interested in a national leadership grant proposal, we have a, uh, coming up soon two webinars for applicants, uh, one actually this afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, one in January, uh, January 6th. And the um, URL on the, on the screen will, will direct you as to how to uh, log in uh, and how to participate in that webinar. And that would be uh, a little more, uh, how do you say, in-depth introduction to how to write a proposal for us. So again, thank you all very much, and I look forward to talking to you, to you all about crowdsourcing ideas. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bob. That's great. Um, so we have the rest of our time together today to entertain questions from those of you out in the audience. And I noticed one along the way that I think is a perfect place to start. 
um, our conversation, particularly with, with Bob and Brett, since they're here as funders. Um, and the question is, since the crowd works for free, which is the way many of these projects work, what is the funding for? Um, what kinds of things are you um, providing funding for when you think about what a federal funder can offer? Bob? Okay. Um, well, again, uh, certainly education and training, and this is the idea that um, the librarians and archivists are going to set up these crowdsourcing projects. They're going to need to know certain things. Um, they're going to have to understand uh, what tools are out there, how to evaluate those tools, to manage a project, et cetera. Uh, there are a whole variety of, of um, prerequisites, so to speak, before kind of launching a, 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 a crowdsourcing project. And uh, the Laura Bush program could address the professional needs uh, as they look forward to uh, uh, how to do this sort of thing. So that's those are one. What's one set of projects? Um, again, um, what we're particularly looking for in national leadership grant are are something uh, are, are things that are going to move the profession forward. So it wouldn't be again something like um, I've seen what New York Public Library does. I have some um, menus myself, or you know, again, I have you know uh, various manuscripts. It's not necessarily a I want one two approach uh, that we'll fund. It's more. Um, uh, here's a new tool, here's a new type of content, here's a new type of, of, of community that we want to address, and we will um, prototype that, examine that, and what will come out of that is information that will help other libraries, archives, and institutions um, move forward as well. And how about you, Brett? What, what kinds of things are you seeing in, um, in the applications around crowd? Crowdfund, crowdsourced projects. What kinds of things are are people building into the ways that they're they're structuring and funding their projects? Uh, sure. Yeah, you know, I, I think that um, you know, one of the things that my office sort of specializes in is funding the infrastructure, uh, the digital infrastructure, to facilitate projects in the humanities, digital projects. So, you know, a, a number of the crowdsourcing grants that we've made thus far were to develop crowdsourcing software and platforms. So in the case like that, of course, the, where the funding goes does go to thing like, things like planning and computer programming and um, bringing in engineers and, and things like that. Um, and certainly, obviously, if you're, if, you, if you're interested in building a, a platform of some sort, that you're going to see, fund, see um, uh, things in your budget like that. But you know, as Bob said, um, now that we are starting to develop these, these off-the-shelf, um, often open-source crowdsourcing platforms that you can, you can repurpose, it certainly brings down the cost significantly because you don't have to pay for all, all, all the infrastructure. That said, there still are costs involved in, in launching any kind of a major project. Um, I think as Bob alluded to, you're going to need to do a lot of planning. You know, you're going to need to do a lot of outreach to your own community, figure out what is the best way to crowdsource this material, and then also remember, you have to collect all that information. You know, do you have the right metadata? Are you collect that you're collecting? Um, are you storing it and preserving it in an appropriate way? Um, how will you make that data available to others? So there is a lot of planning and staff time, I think, involved in putting together a quality uh, crowdsourcing project. And those are the sorts of things you might potentially um, put into a grant application. Right. Right. Well, so that, that's related to a question that we have uh, here from Shane Landrum about about how large a project team, a crowdsourcing project, usually needs, and with what kinds of roles. I wonder if you all might talk about um, opportunities for funding formative research to get ready to do a large-scale crowdsourcing project. It seems to me that that's a question that that might uh, the answer is going to be different depending on what the project is and the content is and and how you as funders approach the sort of formative process for, for funding projects. Planning grants or, or those kinds of things? Well, it, uh, sure. uh, go ahead, Bob. Oh, oh, Brad, you can, please. Okay. Um, yeah, this is Brad. So yeah, we certainly, um, we, we, we have a, a grant program called our Digital Humanities Startup Grant Program, and it is specifically designed to help you during the formative stages of a project. So for, let's just say for sake of discussion that you wanted to launch a, a crowdsourcing opportunity using a particular set of materials, right? Maybe, maybe these are, um, I don't know, medieval manuscripts that you want to do transcription on. 
you might want, you might decide that, you know what, we really aren't ready to launch this yet because we need to do a lot of planning. You might need to talk to other libraries that, that have similar collections. Maybe you should team up with another library and do your, crowds, your, your crowdsourcing project together. Um, you might need to talk to some technology people to get some advice on what the best platform would be. You might need to bring in a metadata librarian to help you on that end. So you could ask for a digitally humanities startup grant program uh, to, to actually help you maybe put together a, a planning phase, like a, a small workshop or a series of meetings or travel to talk to other librarians to try to put your project together and ensure that, you'd ha that you have all the pieces in place for, for a successful project. Right, and, right. and this is Bob. I would basically say ditto to that. I mean, we also have a planning grant category that allows for proposals up to fifty thousand dollars to to explore a topic. Um, ideally, again, you know, there would be some larger impact beyond the individual app institution that's applying, but uh, something uh, that looks at saying, um, you know, we're we're looking at a particular type of a new content that hasn't been uh, a part of a crowdsourcing project. We want to talk to people. Uh, we want to, well, again, as, as Brett was saying, look at the possible collaborations. Uh, that would be fantastic uh, uh, idea, an approach towards um, uh, uh, a proposal. As well, we have something called a National Forum Grant, which is actually what um, is uh, uh, funding um, the project uh, we're all discussing now. Um, and that's uh, essentially a, a kind of a larger scale planning grant, which says, uh, we're looking at a particular aspect or topic, say, of crowdsourcing, and we want uh, to in elicit the viewpoint, some participation and input of, a, of a, a large number of people, either through a series of meetings or uh, a single uh, 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 meeting, but, but basically saying that you're uh, looking at issues that are of a, sort of a, such broad interest uh, that you want to be able to include a significant number of people, and that's a project that could be funded up to $100,000. Well, so we've got um, another, and I think equally related question here about folks who are looking to do crowdsourcing projects that may not be in that category of of national leadership. Are are there funding opportunities in either of your organizations that would support um, care for collections in that way, or description? Crowdsourcing as part of a description project or some larger sense of, of preservation and access. That might be a leading tip to you, Brett, to talk to us about, about the way the rest of your colleagues in NEH and other divisions might feel about these kinds of projects and entertaining those proposals. Absolutely. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a division at the NEH called the Division of Preservation and Access. And um, as the name implies, uh, their grants are really uh, collection-centric. They're about um, preservation of collections and increasing access to collections. So certainly, uh, crowdsourcing could fit quite well into there. In fact, they funded a number of crowdsourcing projects, like the NYPL uh, Map, Warp, Map Warper project. Um, they also have a grant program called Preservation Assistance Grants for smaller organizations. So it's explicitly designed to fund smaller projects at smaller, you know, not, not, not a giant academic libraries, but, but small historical societies or small libraries, things like that. So you can certainly check out that grant program. And they also have one called um, HCRR, which is, which is aimed at much larger collections and things like that, things that are very, uh, collections that, are, that have maybe national importance, that kind of a thing. So we do have a, a variety of different grant programs you can choose from. So please do get in touch if you're curious, and we'd be happy to put you in touch with the right program. Right, right. And, and you, Bob, I know that, that you do a lot of, your various divisions do a lot of collections care kinds of projects, right? Well, it's uh, on the Museum Services Division. Uh, mm. In the Museum Services Division, there's a, a pro program called uh, Museums for America, and that definitely supports uh, uh, collections care and uh, has slightly different uh, goals in, um, than some of the Office of Library Services programs. So I would urge you, if you are a museum, uh, to take a look at that program. Um, from the library side, uh, I would say um, on the National Leadership Grant program especially, we're looking for proposals that, that uh, help libraries and archives make their own decisions about what resources and um, efforts they want to support. So uh, having then outlined possibilities, having you know demonstrated the value of certain tools, having shown 
uh, what models are out there, then I think um, there's not so much uh, a, a possibility that a proposal is going to be competitive, competitive or as competitive if it just says, um, you know, we, we saw that and we would like to do it as well. Um, it's, it really is a situation where uh, once the uh, once the general outlines of what could be a successful crowdsourcing project are, are um, defined, uh, once tools are described, once the options are, are explored, then we, we're uh, expecting libraries to make their own investments in, in many areas. Right, right. Very good. Um, so I think um, we've got a, a good question here about and I'm going to direct this to you, Brett, because I know that you've funded so much of this er of this early work. Um, why so much Why so much emphasis on transcription um, as opposed to other kinds of of data collection um, collection about um, other kinds of of metadata and those sorts of things? I know that you have have funded a, n a nice big range, and I, you just mentioned Map Warper and those kinds of things. I wonder if if you have some favorite projects that might not be of the transcription variety. Sure, sure. Um, well, I mean, probably um, one of our biggest crowdsourcing projects that we funded is probably the metadata games, um, which is, as you know, is really about creating metadata. It's about tagging um, photographs. Um, you know, and, and again, things like Map Warper, where you're actually helping to georectify uh, old maps on top of modern maps, right? Um, so we, we've, we've done a variety of different things, but I, I think there's certainly no, no doubt that in the humanities, certainly, transcription is a big deal um, because humanists deal with tons and tons, um, as you know, of, of old documents, um, and we've never been able to search them before. And transcribing them is like, is like magic because once they're transcribed, suddenly you can search them just like you can a born digital document. So there's no doubt that transcription is uh, certainly something we hear a lot about. Of a lot, a lot of our applicants are interested in transcription, but you know we're still early, early in the early stages of, of of crowdsourcing and kind of citizen science. And I think we're we're very open to any kind of crowdsourcing project. I mean, frankly, I just love the idea of getting people involved in a research project in a, in, a, in a really cool way. Um, and, and, you know, so I, I would encourage you, if you have any innovative, interesting new ideas for a crowdsourcing project, please get in touch. Very good. So we've talked a lot about, um, just by virtue of our topic for today, partnering with the public, the crowd, um, to participate in these kinds of projects. I wonder if you both might comment on, on possible, um, your views on collaborative projects, institutional collaborative collaborations and, and the ways that people are partnering to move this kind of work forward. Um, so Bob, you come from the Institute for Museums and Library Services. There's, there's, there's a collaboration uh, implied in the, in, in the title of your organization. So I wonder if you, if you might speak to that. Well, I, th I think the collaborations are, are really extraordinarily important. Um, one of the things that I, I've seen um, in, in both sides of the, uh, of the IMLS museum and, and library side are that there are relatively few, uh, very few institutions that have the capacity, the resources, and, and the skills to do everything they'd like to do using technology. And when you look at all the aspects that, of technology that could be involved in a crowdsourcing project, um, and Brett was outlining some of those earlier, that you know, you're not only looking at outreach to a community, you're looking at expertise um, and access to content, about content, you're looking for preservation uh, on the back end, you're looking for the tools and the interfaces. That can be an extraordinarily complex um, set of, of responsibilities. And ideally, um, you're taking advantage of the skills and capacities and resources that are already out there. You're not duplicating efforts, you're, you're, you're sharing uh, all that, all of that capacity. So collaborations, I, I think, are, are absolutely critical to demonstrating not just the credibility of a proposal, um, but also uh, demonstrating you know, really the, the kind of uh, return on the investment that there's um, uh, a, a, a very cost-effective and efficient and well-planned approach uh, to the effort. So. Uh, uh, I think that that's all critical in just in terms of the, the project, the grant management aspect to it. In terms of, you know, our audiences and content, 
uh, increasingly, I think we're all aware that from our users' perspective, from our patrons' perspective, they're interested in particular topics and they're not really cognizant of or they don't want to be bothered by the fact that um, librarians and museum curators and, and archivists all have different approaches to things and all our collections are scattered across the country in, in various different isolated professional silos. You know, they want to be able to get access to content no matter what its medium and no matter who's caring for it. And so I think the crowdsourcing proposals address those needs that are pulling together content from multiple sources, um, that are looking to answer patrons' needs rather than addressing kind of institutional traditions uh, or professional traditions. Those are extraordinarily attractive. Right, right. Well, and I want to follow up a, a little bit on, on that, Bob, just for a little bit of clarification, because your national leadership grants now have, uh, they seem to have, um, sort of funding areas of priority that you're interested in. And one of those is the national digital platform funding priority. And, and I want to check and make sure that, that maybe what you're, if my interpretation of what you might be thinking there is correct, is that if you're thinking about a crowdsourcing project, um, that if it would be one that would build on and extend an existing an existing commonly used tool or software, those kinds of things, is that, is that what you were thinking about? That's one possibility. I mean, the other um, consideration would be that you're exposing more and more of your content that you are creating um, or enriching so that it could be integrated or accessed through a national digital mm -hmm. platform or that you're adding it. So not just platform. technical platforms. Yeah, yeah, not just technical, but I mean the content um, and the, uh, uh, the values that go along with it. Great, great. And I, I know... Um, Brett, that you all place a priority on including multi multi institutional um, collaborations in in your application process as well, right? Yeah, I, I think it's fair to say that the, the, probably the majority of things that are, that that I'm funding, certainly in the Office of Digital Humanities lately, involve multiple institutions or at least participants from multiple institutions. Um, I mean, I think that's for a number of reasons. I think that you you, you want to get the perspective. Um, you want to get an outside perspective, particularly if you're building some sort of a, of a platform or a digital system. Um, it's really critical, I think, to get the perspectives of multiple institutions to ensure that it's going to have um, a long-term sustainability. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're building, so for example, if you're working on a project um, that involves a particular type of material, um, uh, maybe from a particular time period or whatever, it would be great to work with other institutions that do the same sort of work to get their perspective. Maybe work with them on a project. I think all, all told, that's going to make things a lot make make for a much stronger project. Right, right, very good. So it appears af from our our chat window here that that we've got folks um, hatching project ideas right now. We've got uh, Kathy Gao. Please forgive me if I've I've mispronounced that. Um, Asking whether or not you know a handful of small historical societies and archives who have sort of uninventoried, inaccessible collections could come together for some some workshops on starting crowdsourcing projects, and that that there might be um, an opportunity to to fund consultants to help with that sort of thing. What say you all to those kinds of ideas, Bob? Could you start Brett? with Brett first? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Brett, sure, Brett, do you have, have yes. a, a, a feeling on sort of to. those kinds of planning and, and supporting of, of consultants and, and training and those kinds of things for, yeah, definitely. for launching? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that, mm -hmm. and that would be a very appropriate place to start a project like that. Because, uh, you know, you really want to um, talk to all the other, you know, in your case, I guess, historical societies, get a, get a better sense for what you have. But most mm -hmm. importantly, I want you need to figure out who your crowd is, you know, that's a really important point in, in any crowdsourcing project. I think that crowdsourcing projects that fail often fail because they haven't identified who their customer is. In other words, simply saying, hey, we're going to slap this material up there and people from around the world are all going to help us do X or Y to it isn't going isn't to work. What's in it for the people who are helping you do the transcription or identifying the maps or whatever, whatever they're doing? Um, you need to come up with a compelling reason for why uh, members of the public would really want to do this. 
and you need to figure out who those public people are. In other words, not every crowdsourcing project is going to appeal to everyone in the world. Um, we have funded projects that have narrower scopes and much wider scopes. If you like, like, like take the New York Public Library, what's on the menu? Well, that appeals to almost everybody because almost everybody eats food. Um, so you know, they had millions of people, literally. I think they had a, almost a million people, if I remember correctly, helping to uh, transcribe those menus. But then you look on the other side of the coin. You know, we helped um, the Perseus Project at Tufts University had a terrific idea. Um, they are they are they are have a project where undergraduate classics majors who are have, who are learning Greek and Latin, rather than learning Greek and Latin by translating just kind of rote texts out of a textbook, they're translating texts, uh, ancient Greek and ancient Latin texts from the Perseus project. And once they're done with their translation, it gets checked by the teacher, and then it's eventually put into the Perseus project so that people around the world can then utilize those translations. So that's an example where the students are getting something out of it because they're learning to speak Latin and Greek, and they feel like they're participating in a major research project. And of course, it helps the, 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 the world later on when, they, when they're done. But that's, again, that's a project with a limited audience. It's in this case, Greek and Latin students. And that's OK. You might have a project that has a limited audience, but you just need to identify who those people are. Excellent. That's wonderful. So I feel like we probably have time for one more question, and it's kind of um, it's one that we frequently get because we're thinking about crowdsourcing. It's the question of crowdfunding, and and I'm going to add a spin to to that. Everybody has had some experience of seeing something on on Kickstarter or GoFundMe or or those kinds of things, but I'm wondering about about how our our federal funders are feeling about how crowdfunding might might work into your calculus for, I don't know, matching or those kinds of things, um, or, or as, as a sustainability path or any of those sorts of things. Brett, have you seen any, any applications that have, have come in with crowdfunding as, as a piece of the larger conversation? I haven't seen too many. Um, I, we do have some grant programs here at the NEH that require matching. In particular, the ones in our challenge grants office require matching. And indeed, if you were to raise money via crowd via crowdfunding, you could use that money to match your federal um, grant. So you certainly would, can, can, that would be, certainly be a good vehicle. Um, but I, I would say in general that if you if you had a project that had a strong crowdfunding pro, uh, element to it, I think that is something that NEH peer reviewers would see in a positive light because it, it, it would be indicative of the fact that you have a community that is interested in sustaining your work. And that can only help you when you're trying to apply for a grant. Great. And, and Brett, you entertain, your uh, agency entertains um, applications from a variety of different kinds of private institutions and public institutions. You don't have to be a library. You don't have to be a museum. Right. That's correct. You basically, as long as you're a nonprofit organization, um, you could be a private nonprofit, you could be a, a university, you could be a school, you could even be a local government. Um, you're eligible to apply for an NEH grant. Right. And Bob, on Bob, on your side, um, are there restrictions about uh, having a partner who is a, a a library or an archive or a museum in order to fund those grants? Our eligibility criteria are fairly close to what Brett described. Um, okay. And, you know, the emphasis is on libraries, but it's fairly broadly design, defined. Um, universities as a whole can apply. Nonprofit institutions very often uh, can apply, and uh, local government, uh, state government can apply as well. Um, one thing I was going to add about the crowd fund, uh, funding, um, mm -hmm. and this may be a sort of uh, slightly off base, but one of the things that you, you, you know, referenced earlier that I used to work for the Minnesota Historical Society, and um, one of the things our development office, which was a fairly sophisticated, very sophisticated uh, operation, noted about volunteers was that uh, the, getting someone engaged in doing something with the historical society was often the first step in a kind of progress towards donations, uh, membership, et cetera. So uh, a lot, uh, I could easily see uh, proposals uh, relating crowdsourcing to that kind of activity in, in terms of sustainability is that you know we're trying to build a community around our institution and engaging the community in crowdsourcing has uh, not just the advantage of creating a particular product, but um, 
also fostering and, and sustaining relationships that are going to strengthen uh, the institution over the long term. Well, I think that's a wonderful note to end on today. We've had a good conversation. And I know that those of you out there, we may have missed some questions along the way, which you can um, continue to transmit to us via Twitter. Uh, the Twitter handle is at Crowd Consortium. Or um, you can see on this last slide here that there's contact information. You can send us an email. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining us. I want to thank Brett and Bob for answering your questions and Jennifer for, for guiding us through this. And um, good luck with your crowdsourcing.